We welcome you this morning to the word of the Lord. Anybody ready to receive from God? Amen. This morning I want to speak on press on. Everyone say press on. Don't look back. You're not going that way. Amen. You're not going that way. You're pressing on. So I'm going to read to you from Mark 10, verse uh, 46. Now they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with the disciples, a great multitude, and blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more. Everyone say, all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. I want you to say that, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. Christ is calling us forward today. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus healed him, he received his sight, and he followed Jesus. From Philippians 3 and 13, brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward. Someone say reaching forward. To what lies ahead, I press on. Someone say, I press on toward the goal to win the prize of the call of God in Christ Jesus. Say it again. I press on. I press on. Father, we welcome your Holy Spirit in this room today. Speak to us, sir. This is your room. Jesus is the head of this church, but Holy Spirit, this is your room. Speak to my brothers and sisters, even what I do not say. Bring forth that which you have prepurposed for this service. In closing, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine today. And we stand in the gap for the believers there. We stand in the gap for President Zelensky, who is fighting like a lion. We pray and we stand in the gap for the thousands of orphans. We stand in the gap for the persecuted church, Lord, that are showing up strong for the cause of Jesus Christ. Even though their faith does not feel good, even though their courage is under fire, they continue to stand for the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God. And we will not shirk in our responsibilities, but we stand in the gap for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. In Jesus' name and amen. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise. In case you have missed the news, Russia has invaded Ukraine. I don't know what ha will happen. I don't know. The prophets in my life don't know either. We're all just waiting to see. But I will tell you this, the church of Jesus is showing up in Ukraine. They're worshiping in the subway. They're worshiping in the bomb shelter. They're praising Jesus. The missionaries have set themselves like a flint to see their people survive. President Zelensky himself, who is Jewish, has risen to the occasion. When our president offered him a ride out of the United States, he said, I don't need a rod, I need ammunition. When they said, when Russia said, I'm coming for you, President Zelensky said, you can come, but we will not run. You will not see the back of our heads, but you will see our faces, because we're going to fight, come on. As Russia is dropping bombs on the Ukraine, the church is standing strong. The church is praying. The Ukrainians are fighting. Regardless of your political alliance or your belief in ammunition, they are passing out ammunition to anyone that will take it. It's like the days of Nehemiah. They will be fighting house to house to defend their cause. They're living for a cause greater than themselves, and they're going to, some of them, die for a cause greater than themselves. But Jesus is not asking you to die for a cause today. He's asking you to live for a cause that is greater than yourself. And and that is the mission of Jesus Christ to save the whosoever. Someone give him a shout. I love that. One of the cute things that I'm moving on from this point. One of the cute things is there's a group called the Babushkas. And it's grandmothers with weapons. 
and you can look them up online. Watch your sources because there's a lot of false messages. I trust the missionaries that are connected to people I know. And they're putting pictures of the babushkas, the grandmothers laying with their artillery to defend their grandchildren. I want us to live that for our children and our grandchildren, we have something to fight for. We might say to each other, it's a terrible time to raise children in this world, my little Skylar. But you know what? There's never been a better time to raise dragon slayers than the time that dragons roam the earth. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. That's a cause. I love that Poland has opened their borders and said, bring your pets with you. I love that Poland has lined up at the stadium to give blood for their brothers and sisters. I love this. I love that in the area of Poland and Warsaw, they knew what it was like when Hitler, a blue-eyed, frenzied demoniac, came in and took over Warsaw and made them be in concentration camp. If you've never seen the real evidence, Barbara and I, Pastor Barbara and I, were in Jerusalem. We went into the Holocaust Museum. We could barely count the tears, and we got in trouble with Perry because we were still in there when the bus was loaded. Come on. He's like, I knew I should have let Rhonda into that museum. But we came out with tears because we saw them fight back. Why do I say this? For you to press forward, faith is not always going to feel good. They don't have goosebumps right now. Oh, I hope I can shoot a Russian. Well, maybe a few cray-cray do. But most of them are just saying, I'm going to do this because it's something worth fighting for. Your destiny is something worth fighting for. Your family is something worth fighting for. You see, the early church, the New Testament church, their faith did not feel good when their children were dressed up in the lamb, in the, the uh, coat of sheep and put in the middle of stadium by Nero and they watched their children be devoured by lions and historians say through the works of Josephus you could hear the sound of parents wailing and crying as they took their last breath saying glory to the blood of the lamb glory to the redeemer because they had seen the Christ and you and I have got to see Christ and believe we've got something worth fighting for someone give him praise come on someone give him praise they live for a cause, and the, the, the place that we walk, the path, is a path that we've got to hold on to our faith when it doesn't feel good. Faith is faith when you take it off yourself and you put it on the reality of a God who can call things as they are even though they are not. In this age of cynicism and doubt and skepticism and uncertainty, you better really watch your faith. You better guard it like the babushkas guard their grandchildren today. Hallelujah. And the church is guarding their, their heritage today in that war-torn land of Ukraine. You better guard your own faith. If you let one negative force get in to control you, you're going to come under subjection to criticism. And cynicism is born out of delusion, delusionment. There you go. Delusionment means to be del disillusioned. Someone disillusioned. When immediate answers are not found, you see, the enemy bombards us with thoughts to sow seeds, to bring doubt. Do I really believe in this thing? And then when he sows that doubt, we begin to have our hope destroyed. But you, my friend, must stand fast in your faith. You're not in Ukraine. I'm not asking you to go to Ukraine. Thank God for the USA. But like Paul, you and I have got to say, my faith is worth fighting for. I am persuaded that he is able to do what he has committed because of his power. Someone say amen. amen. Feelings originate in the soul. They cannot be trusted. We all want to be happy. We love to sing the, you know, what's his name? Yeah, little, yeah, there you go. We want to sing happy. We love it when it comes on at a wedding. Everybody's dancing. But that's not where we always live. Feelings are not to be trusted or embraced. If I'm only going to do right and serve Christ when I feel it, I would not have made it this far to 60 years old. If you build your life on feelings, you will not get where the Lord wants to take you, and that is forward. Our faith needs to arise to the level of dependent, not on how good we feel, but our faith should say, I believe God. Who should we look to for this? To Jesus, but also to the trail before us. The cost of those, of our pastors, blood that went into the earth and he rose to the, to the Father. We should trust those that have gone before us. These are not fairy tales, but these are people whose faith carried them forward. 
faith is Joseph in prison for 12 years when his brother collapsed at his feet and he said, don't worry, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Faith is young David running from Saul, fleeing for his life, yet he believed that God said he would be king. You've got to hold on to what God said about your future when everything looks opposite. Can I get a man? Faith is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego facing the fiery furnace and saying, our God is able to deliver us, but even if he does it, we are not going to bow. Bring in the babushkas because we're going to fight. Come on, somebody. Faith is Father Abraham, even though his body was as good as dead, that he said, I believe God, it shall be as he said to me, against hope, in hope, Abraham believed. God is looking for some people to go forward that will say, in hope, against hope, I don't care where hope is, I believe. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. Faith is those 11 disciples turning the world upside down because they had encountered Christ. You and I need to see Christ. There's a place in scripture in King David's life where he had to move forward, but it was tough. You're going to identify with a couple of these moments before we go on to Bartimaeus. This is the biggest part of this message right here. In 2 Samuel 12, David has had an affair with Bathsheba. And Bathsheba's when, you know, he killed her husband. He had him killed. So you know the story. That's not where I'm going to focus. And a child is born, but the child is very sick. And the child is very sick unto death. And it has been said the child is going to be dead by Nathan. David lays on the ground in sackcloth before the Lord. And we believe that he put on what's called a mourner's garment. And as he put on this garment, just draped this around my shoulders, he laid flat before the Lord. David's laying there. He's not eating. For seven days, he's pleading with God. But I'd like to take that seven days and make it a season or moments in our life when things feel like we've lost and we can't get back control. The Bible says that he has to go forward. Someone say, press on and move forward. His elders came to him and tried to raise him up. The Bible says his elders came to the king and they tried to raise him up. You ever tried to raise somebody up that didn't want to be raised up? But I'm going to say beyond that, only the Lord can raise us up. Look at your neighbor and say, only the Lord. They try their best. But I want you to get this picture. He is laying on this floor with this beggar's garment on. And as he's laying there, I wonder what's going through his mind. Ephesians 3 and 10 says, To the intent that the manifold wisdom of God may be known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. And I wonder as the angels and the principalities were viewing as they view viewing on us, they're thinking, he's done. He's done. This is the man who killed Goliath with one stone. This is the man who killed the bears and the lion with one stone. This is the man who slew thousands of Philistines. He was a mighty warrior. He was a mighty man, a man's man, what my husband would say. He was an awesome man. It was the man who had brought the ark back to the temple. Everyone say big moments. But how many know big moments don't keep you from finding yourself on the face of your carpet saying to the Lord, how do I go forward here? How do I move on? And in this moment, as he's on his face and they're trying to lift him up, I wonder what voices he fought with trying to go forward. I mean, his great-grandmother was a harlot. She was a prostitute, Rahab. I mean, she was a spirit of prostitute. Has anyone's ever been a prostitute? But God saved her and put her into the lineage of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Don't you ever tell, let anyone tell you that your past is too big. If David and if Jesus' great-great-grandmother can be a prostitute, you can be anything and be redeemed by Jesus. Come on, somebody. Give him a hand. I wonder what went through his mind as he laid on his face saying to God, it's done, it's over. I was sitting one time with a great prophet whose words have never fallen to the ground. None of you have ever met him, maybe one person in this room. A great prophet. I didn't know who he was, but I heard him as he said to someone. He said, God said he never wanted that to happen to you, and it was a mistake. And I saw this person weep and say, how can God call that a mistake? It was so much more than a mistake. It was horrendous sin, and I hurt so many people. 
And the prophet said, because God has redeemed that by the blood. And to him, merely it is a mistake. And what do you do with a mistake? If you're typing a mistake, you wipe it out. If you're typing a mistake in a text, you delete it. Jesus Christ deletes those things in our life. And to him be the glory and the honor and the power forever. Somebody give him a shout of praise in this room. But I think he's probably saying in this moment, this giant slayer, this dragon slayer, this mighty man, this is too much. It's too much. I can't go forward. There's no way I can get off this ground. The interesting thing is that at this moment, you know, I love to talk about the cry of purpose was going before the throne room. Because listen, when you don't feel like you can go move forward, can I remind you of all the people you're going to help? This was before he was going to restore Mephibosheth and give him grace. Mephibosheth would have lived in Lodabar the rest of his life if David had not got him off the floor. I'm going to present to you today and submit to you by the Holy Spirit. You need to keep moving forward because there are people in your future you've not met yet. There are people you are going to help redeem. If you don't get up off the floor and answer the commission of Christ in the moment that you want to die, there will be no fruit there. Someone give Jesus praise this morning. Come on. This was before more Philistines that he would kill. And it was before the prophecy would have been said that Jesus would be the son of David. David, if he had stayed on the floor, if he had died on the floor, if he had given up on the floor, that thing that was to come through him would have never come through him. And Bartimaeus could have never said, Jesus, the son of David, because David would have been annihilated. But I have to believe in that moment that his faith rose up. Someone say his faith rose up. I believe because angels probably attended to him. He didn't even know it because when you're under the gloom of despair, King Jesus has all the authority. He said in Psalms 91 through the words of Moses, I will give my angels charge over you and they will lift you up. Somebody give Jesus praise in this room this morning. Come on. I love it that Isaiah 63 says in all their distress, he too was distressed, and he sent the angel of his presence. I have been distressed before. I have gone to bed. I'm not talking about the last six months. I'm talking all through my life and thought, I'm done. Anybody with me? This thing has broken my heart. This thing has scared the hell out of me. I hope that doesn't offend you. This thing has freaked me out. I can't rise another moment. Jesus, if you want to have a one-woman rapture, here I am. Come on, somebody. Just take me up, Jesus. But somewhere in the night, something happened. I, if it was a dream, I don't remember it. If it was a song, I can't recall it, though sometimes you can. But what I do know is I woke up the next morning, and for some reason I began to believe you can make it through this day. You are not done yet. I believe because the Lord sends angels in the middle of the night. I believe the Holy Spirit sends things. I believe the word of Zephaniah 3. What is this, a mighty choir here? No, it is the Lord rejoicing over you you in song. He's singing a song. I think sometimes in the darkness of night, the Lord just sings in the middle of our spirit. We don't even know it. And he says, you're not done yet. I love you. You are mine. I have called you by my name. I may wake up the next morning and I don't remember as I stumble to the hot tea. All I remember, Pastor Barbara, that burden is a little bit lighter that morning. Somebody give Jesus praise in this house. I believe he penned the words that he wrote himself in Psalm 16 and 8. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken for he is right beside me. I may be on my floor after a big bump in my life, a disappointment, a discouragement. But I believe Psalms 42 that David would say, oh, my soul. I always say you might be crazy if you're not talking to yourself. Oh, my soul, why are you so disturbed? You wait to get a word from somebody else, but you and I've got to learn to stand up and speak the word to ourselves, and say, oh, so why are you so discounted? In God yet will I hope he is my savior and I will not be shaken. He alone is my rock and my salvation. Somebody praise him. And for all the mistakes in our life, I believe it's Amanda, as he's on the floor, I believe he probably came to him once Solomon, his son, would pen in Proverbs 24 and 16. 
A righteous man may fall many times, but he will rise again and again and again. I believe maybe the words of Micah 7 and 8, whenever you're in that moment, do not rejoice over me, O oh my enemy. You see, on the face, his enemies are saying he's done now. He's had this huge mistake. I mean, you can't get past this. He's the king. Jesus is supposed to come through his line. But I believe he began to say, do not rejoice over me, over my tragedies. Oh, there's people in your life and seasons, mind you, that say, oh, that's it, that's it. He, she's down for the count. She's done. Boop, boop. That, that trial's taken her out. That sickness taken her out. That sorrow is taking him out. But Micah went on to say, though I fall and I might be on my face, I will rise again. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord is my light. Somebody give Jesus a hand clap of praise this morning. Come on, let him hear it all over this house. Let him hear it all over this house. Come on, give him praise all over this house. And the Bible says that David rose from the ground. We'll get there in just a second. Sometimes in life we get knocked down. However, we have to decide whether or not we are going to stay down. Paul said, but this precious treasure, this light from the New Living Translation and power that now shines within us is held in perishable containers. That in our weak bodies, so everyone can see that our glorious power, I want you to say, my glorious power is from God and not on our own. We are perplexed, but we don't give up and quit. We are hurled down, but God never forsakes us and never abandons us. We may get knocked down, it goes on to say, but we're going to get back up. And the New Living Translation said again and again and again, and we're going to keep going. Someone give Jesus a praise this morning. Come on, someone. And David did something so powerful. He changed his clothes. Well, he washed his face, symbolic of cleansing of the word, but I can't go there. But he changed his clothes. You see, he took off that beggar garment and he put back on the king's garment. When we receive Jesus as Savior, that beggar garment is supposed to be off of us. But I might be the only one in here that's put the beggar garment back on time and time again. Through pity and no one comes to the party. Can I get an amen? Through self-doubt, through whatever is going on in our life. He changes and he puts back on the king's garment. Because in biblical biblical times, your clothes spoke volumes about your story. What are you wearing today and what does it say about your story? Not your physical clothes, but what are you wearing? He put back on the king's garment. You see, you and I have not only got to put back on the king's garment, but realize moving forward is a tribute to God and his influence in your life. Don't make a tribute to the past, but begin to decide and say, regardless of the issues, I am. Someone say, I am. Moving forward. Isaiah 61 says, the anointed one, he will anoint you and give you beauty. Say beauty for ashes. If you're still sitting in ashes, you've taken the king's garment off. Or you've not allowed him to heal you. Oil of joy for mourning. Grief can come and go how well I know. But there is an oil of joy that drives grief and despair off of your head and off of your spirit. Can I get an amen? And he will give me the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And the Bible says after he changed clothes, he went into the house and he worshiped. Follow me. In 1983, January, no, December 31st, 1983, a man named Hank Davis was in Bellflower, California. He had, his wife had divorced him three years previously. And that night, Josh, if you'll come and play through the rest of my message, I'm not quite near done, just to set the pace for what we want to do here this morning or the atmosphere. And that night, thieves broke into my in-law's house in Southern California, and they stole the last symbol he believed for three years against all hope that we'd be restored. And thieves came in and, and stole nothing but his wedding ring. When he walked outside, he said to God, that was the last thing I had. That was the last symbol of that marriage, and now that's gone too. And he said he heard the enemy's voice say, give up, give up, let it go. Make arrangements to settle for something less. But he began to lift his hands, that skinny little preacher that he was back then. 
And he began to worship. I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. And one of his favorites for I exalt thee. And he began to worship and walk and war. And then he declared, I don't propose this to anyone for a miracle. You got to hear this from God. But he said, I will fast till you give me back the wife of my youth. He was quite a determined man. And for three weeks to the very day, God healed our marriage. Someone give Jesus praise for that. And then I didn't know about any of that, but as I was going through my inner healing and the Lord was healing me, I learned the thing of worship. That's where the Lord made me a real worshiper. I was as a child, but it really taught me how to worship. And it began just worship the Lord as the Lord was healing my heart and seeing the Lord like King David, getting my garment back on so I could move forward. And I remember one night after three weeks of inner healing and the middle of the night, my roommate was on the other bed in the room. I lived with three of the girls at Lee University in a little house. And I woke up and Phil Driscoll, we, we kept something on loop all night on an, you know, an old, big old thing that we played our music on back in that day. And uh, Phil Driscoll was singing, For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. And I remember kind of waking up and then we I exalt thee. I'll change keys seven times. I exalt thee. Pastor Hank hated that about me. Why do you always change keys? I said, like, because I can do it. Um, I exalt thee. In the presence of the Lord, I sat up in the bed, startled, and the presence of the Lord had filled the room so deep. And I said, oh. I was like, oh. my roommate was still saying, was like, what is it? What is it? All I could feel were angels were in the room. I couldn't see anything, was afraid to look. And the Spirit of the Lord just pressed and said, just wait and see. Just wait and see. I had no idea what that meant, but I will tell you this, that night, I went after three weeks of healing and another process I can't go into. I went in to hear Hank Davis preach at the end of his message. He said, everyone just lift your hands, Cedar Valley, ran about a thousand, and praise the Lord for who he is and what he's done in your life. And I began to lift my hands and I began to worship the Lord for, for who you are, Jesus, and what you've done in my life. I worship you. And as I did in that moment, the spirit of the Lord went, as you've heard the story from Pastor Hank to me and back to me like a lightning bolt. That which he could not make happen, that which I couldn't make happen, was happened in a moment when worship was merely offered up. And I tell you this not to make you sad, and sometimes my ch someday my children and I will talk about this. It's not the day to day. But when I had to say bye to him, my children would tell you I kept saying, King Jesus, King Jesus, I worship you, King Jesus. I had said everything to him I wanted to say for six days, knowing that he could hear it. My children worshipped. We kept worshiping, but I just kept saying, King Jesus, King Jesus, King Jesus, I worship you. I don't know how to tell you what happened, but I know to say goodbye to someone that's been my very life for 40 years, that the king's garment came back on me once again. And that night when I had to come here and tell my precious church family, we thought we were praying hell, hell down and heaven down. But I said, after I had to tell them that he was gone or he had moved to heaven, you know what we did? We worshiped. We worshiped for about an hour and we sang the songs of faith. And it might seem crazy, but I'm telling you today, it is worship that will put back on the garment of praise. Come on, if you've forsaken that worship, if you've forsaken your private worship, if you've forsaken that music, Bring it back up. King David knew it was his music that drove the demons off of Saul. And I believe in that morning he believed and remembered, if I worship him, he will put my king's garment back on. If I praise him, if I get my eyes off of everybody around me and what I've lost and just begin to worship the king eternally, mortal, invisible, the only wise God, I will be clothed again. Somebody praise him this morning. The powerful thing is that David and Bathsheba, I just can't let this go, they conceived another child. It's one of the most beautiful things in Scripture to me because he was so broken. And when they birthed this child together after their painful past, the Lord called him Jedediah, which meant Solomon. 
because the Lord said, I so love this child. You see, sometimes in our life we feel like a season maybe God didn't care about or maybe we made a mistake or things didn't go well or we're disappointed. But then God always says to you, I will appoint a new season. I will appoint a new seed. I will cause what intended to be evil to be used for my good. And it was that child, Solomon, that built the temple in Jerusalem and reigned. And David and Bathsheba saw their sorrow. They traded their sorrow for joy, their sickness for glory. Somebody give Jesus a praise in this house. Somebody give Jesus a praise in this house. And he put on the king's garment. I love the song we used to sing. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. You remember that? That's what happens in worship. We trade that sorrow. King David went on to do mighty things. But I want to tell you something. A revival came through him. A revival came through Eve's seed after she disappointed God. And there's a new season coming for you. There's a new appointment. Don't let the things in the last season keep you from the next season. Look at your neighbor and say, keep moving forward. Come on, give Jesus a hand. Keep moving forward. Come on, give Jesus a hand in this place. In Mark 10, I read you the verse. It was right before Jesus' passion. Hang with me, people. We'll get this together here. I'm glad this isn't on video. It's all good. I have felt before much bigger crowds. Give me a hand. Come on. Um, Jesus is on his way to the passion. He goes through Jericho, and the road is filled with the rich. It's like a parade, Pastor Ramon. Curiosity seekers, believers, scorners, doubters, all kind of people. But there's also a group too poor, handicapped, beggars. Bartimaeus was one of those. His name means Bartimaeus, which means son of the same. He was blind, which means that his dad was a blind beggar as well. You ever put on a garment from your past? You ever put on a garment from your daddy or your aunt uh, Bertha or whoever? You ever put on a garment and said, this is the way it's always going to be. My grandmother was insane. I'll be insane. My father wasn't faithful. I won't be faithful. They never rose above their education. I won't rise above their education. Guess what? The beggar's garment has got to go because the king's garment is going to accelerate you. Come on, somebody. Give Jesus a hand in this house. But you got to think about all the disappointments that he had handled. you got to think about all the times he had called out for someone to help him. But he heard. Someone say he heard. He heard that the rabbi, Jesus, was coming through. You can imagine the disappointments. Disappointment leads to discouragement. Discouragement leads to disillusionment. Disillusionment leads to depression and then defeat. That's where the enemy wants to keep you. All God's people have had to deal with disappointment. And here is Bartimaeus, and I'm sure he had called out to the local healer. He had tried medicine. He had tried everything. But then he hears, I'm going to tell you something. He got faith in his heart to ask one more time. And I'm going to say to some people in this room and listening by podcast, God is saying, ask it one more time. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Ask for that prodigal. Ask for that fresh anointing. Ask for the return of your joy. Ask for the return of your focus. It's nothing greater than asking for something in the same area you were disappointed before. In 1961, on the front of the Dallas newspaper, there was an article. I've seen it. And it talked about a little boy. What happened is his grandmother was keeping him. The parents had gone out to dinner. And she didn't know he was asleep. They said he's fine. But the mother's evening gown, the dry cleaning garment, was blown by the ceiling fan and was over the two-year-old. And when she went to check on him about 30 minutes later, he was gone. He was not breathing. She went to the landline. She called. The ambulance got stuck, couldn't make it. Finally, a fire chief came, found her at the end of the road holding her dead grandson. But she began to praise God. The fire chief said he's gone. But she lifted her hand. What she said was, I praise you, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I praise you that my grandson is going to give you glory, and you're going to use him for your kingdom. Somebody give Jesus a hand clap of praise. What's more powerful, forgive me, is what she didn't say. What she didn't say. What she didn't say was, I had cancer years ago, and had a radical mastectomy and the radiation burnt me all the way up to here. You can see a picture of her on that in that article. It burned her all the way up to here. Her husband left her 
for her daughter's best friend. When she lifted her hand, she didn't remind God of any of that. All she said, sometimes we just want to lift our hands and we should cry out to God. But she didn't say any of that. She asked God for a miracle in a place where she had only received disappointment. God is speaking to someone this morning. And she lifted her hands and began to worship him. And when she did, the fire chief yelled out and said, what? And looked down. Baby Keith <gasps> breathed in and breathed out. And today, Pastor Keith pastors in Dallas, Texas, a man of God fulfilling his commission. Come on, somebody give Jesus praise in this house. Give Jesus praise in this house because he is able. He is worthy. He is able. He is worthy. You can stand up all over this place. I'll finish this last few minutes on your feet. Come on, give Jesus praise. Come on, give Jesus praise. Listen to me. That was a miracle to ask again. And Bartimaeus, watch this. He moved past what he heard because what he was hearing was people say, shut up. Don't keep bothering the master. Shut up. You're the son of the same. Nothing better is going to happen for you. But what he heard was so powerful. And the Bible says something very interesting. It says that he threw off his cloak, his beggar's cloak. Why is that important? Blind people in that biblical time, they folded it up and then they counted the steps to where they were going to make sure they could get back because that was their only source of income. But when he threw it off, what he was saying is, I'm not keeping a contingency plan. You know that plan B. If Jesus doesn't come through, I'm just going to go live for the, if this doesn't happen, I'm going to go to do that. Someday you got to burn your ships and say, I'm all in, I'm all in, I'm all in, I'm all in for Jesus Christ. I will have no contingency plan. Come on, somebody. I'll do the work of the kingdom whether you recognize me or not. I'll be faithful whether you accolade me or not. If no one stands with me, I'm speaking for for all of us, I will stand past the disappointment. Come on, somebody give Jesus. This is so powerful. Listen, when one thing breaks down in your life, it's okay. God will use what's left. He had lost his sight, but he didn't need his sight to get to Jesus. All he needed was his hearing. You've got enough left to get where you need to go. You don't need anything you lost to bless you. I lost my husband to heaven. I didn't lose him forever. I will be with him one day. I will go with him one day. But I did not lose him forever. But I don't have to have him to come back for my life to be blessed. My mother is there. I've lost people that I've loved through the years. I've been betrayed. I've encountered all kinds of things I've betrayed. It's all happened. It's all done. But Jesus says to you today, and he says to me, you don't need anything that you lost that's behind you. All he needed was to hear and get toward the voice of Jesus because Jesus Jesus didn't need him to use what he had lost. All he needs you and I is to use what we have to rise up and follow him. Somebody praise him today. Somebody praise him today. And he put on the king's garment and took off his beggar garment. Paul told Timothy, remember Christ. Paul told Timothy, dig through your swamped mind like a grave covered with dirt and pull out an image of Jesus. You see, if you're going to move forward, you're going to have to follow the steps of Christ who put on the beggar's garment. The Bible said he clothed himself with flesh. He was king. Before the world began, the Lamb of God was chosen to be slain. But he put on a beggar's garment. He put on my sin. He put on my mistakes. He put on my humanity. But when he was going to the cross, he kept the garment on because he knew there was a divine exchange coming. You see, faith did not feel good to the Lord Jesus Christ. He stayed committed on the Via Della Rosa all the way to the crucifixion for the joy set before him. Did faith feel good to him when his Judas betrayed him? Oh, that's when some people say, you're done. That's a sign. God's done with you. It's a sign. You've been betrayed by someone that worshiped with you in the house of the Lord. You've been betrayed by your best friend, your ex-boyfriend, your ex-whatever. No, Jesus knew there was no sign that God was done with him because he was going to keep moving forward. Come on, somebody. Did faith feel good when he stood before Pilate? Did he have goosebumps 
when they mocked him king of Jews. He was the most beat up champion you've ever seen. I guarantee you he felt no goosebumps, but he quoted the psalmist, for the Lord God will help me and I shall not be confounded. The Bible says he set his face like a flint toward Calvary. God is looking for some babushkas and some men and women of God and some young people that will say, I'm setting my face like a flint for the cause of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. I bet he felt no goosebumps, but he went on what God had said to him. You are my beloved son. I'm almost done. Hang with me. He hung on a cross above religious leaders. Just get this, get this. First, the soldiers that are playing a game on his robe. And then furthermore, the religious left on their little high horse before the world shook with God's anger. And they went out to dinner. They ate and they drank and they probably danced and laid with their beautiful wives at night while he laid cold in a grave. But he kept convinced that he would go forward. Isaiah said, who is this coming from the wine press, wearing a garment dripped in blood? And it says, Jesus says, it is I. No one would bring salvation. So I stretched out my own arm. Someone say God's arm. And I brought salvation. It is I who is mighty to save. With a beggar's garment, he went to Calvary. With your sorrow, with your mistake, with your defeat, with your discouragement, with your inadequacy, he wore it like a beggar's garment. When they nailed him and they hung him up and the world thought he was done, he died as a beggar on the cross of Calvary. But I've got good news for you in three days he rose from the center of the earth and God put a king's robe come by to somebody praise Jesus and he put on that king's robe and he rose from the grave worship team if you come to this stage please because we're going to end this service with worshiping in these altars and it says that he rose from the grave when the dunamis and the exousia power of the Holy Spirit shook the earth and moved the tomb and picked him up and raised him up and knocked out the Roman soldiers. I'm going to tell you, sometimes we leave too early in the middle of the story. Sometimes we leave too early in the middle of a season. Sometimes we leave too early in the middle of something we're going on and we don't give God the moment when he's going to roll the tomb back and do something supernatural. Come on. Come on. Stay till God is done. Because it was not finished and it says in the book of Philippians, Paul writes under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And God has given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and in earth. At the name of Jesus, demons tremble. At the name of Jesus, salvation comes to the prodigal. At the name of Jesus, marriages are healed. At the name of Jesus, disease must leave. At the name of Jesus, life comes and springs eternal at the name of Jesus there is power it's not on the conditions of man grow weary with man if you must but grow focused with Jesus Christ the son of the almighty God somebody praise him come forward if you can we're going to worship I've got one more thing to say but just come forward in the altars and stand everyone if you will just calling you to worship come on these last few moments and we're going to let you go Come on, come and gather, come and gather, come and gather. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can do that one or you can do that, that spontaneous one you did in the middle that you choose. You... So hear me. This is what John saw. This is why Jesus kept moving forward and his power is with you today. You got to stop looking back. David had to stop looking back and get back on the king's garment and let God bring everything into the earth he wanted. Bartimaeus had to lay down that beggar's cloak and get the king's cloak on and start walking like a child of God. And it says he got up and followed Jesus. And King Jesus put on the beggar's coat. No other man did it before him, but he did it. But then there was a divine exchange back to the holy king's garment. And John saw a vision of Jesus that we'll all see soon. My beloved husband will be riding with him. Then I saw heaven open and a white horse was standing there. His rider was named Faithful and True. 
for he judges fairly and he wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. A name was written to him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe, a kingly robe, dipped in blood and his title was the word of God and the armies of heaven my grandmother my mother my husband so many of those that gone before us they rode with him dressed in pure white linen they followed him on white horses as on his robe and his thigh was written this title king of kings someone say king of kings and lord of lords Give him one more praise and we're going to worship. Come on, give Jesus. Give Jesus praise. Come on. Give Jesus praise. Give Jesus praise. Come on, give Jesus praise. Now the team is going to sing and I want you to create your own altar, your own worship right where you are. These last five minutes, I want you to worship the Lord. I've shared some intimate moments of my life, some I couldn't share yet, where worship made all the difference. And I just want you to worship Him. I want you to worship Him with a focus of, I'm blessing you, Lord Jesus. I'm bringing you in worship my disappointments because I know you're able. I'm bringing you anything, Lord, that's holding me back. And I'm asking you to help me to move forward, King of kings and Lord of lords. I come to worship you. I'm taking off the beggar garment, whatever that is. I'm taking off the garment of betrayal, the garment of deception, the garment of disappointment of myself. Whatever it is, I'm taking it off. And I'm putting on the king's garment that I can worship you. Go and lift, lift your hands. If you get tired of standing, kneel down. But let's stay right here in this altar till this song is done. Come on. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you in this. This is your room. Oh. 